Hello, Ed Choice's Director of State Research and Policy Analysis, Drew Cat here. We're back with a new Ed Choice chat. In this episode, we're discussing our latest Ed Choice report, Back to the Staffing Surge, the great teacher salary stagnation, and the decades long employment growth in American public schools. In this new report, Dr. Ben Scafidi, Ed Choice Friedman Fellow and Professor and Director of the Education Economic Center at Kennesaw State University, measures U.S. public school employment growth versus student growth, as well as teacher salary fluctuations and student outcomes over the past 65 years, using publicly available data that state departments of education annually report to the U.S. Department of Education. And I'm sitting here with Ben to discuss what inspired this research and what school leaders, teachers, citizens, and policymakers can do to improve the American education system in light of these findings. Ben, thanks for coming all the way from the Peach State to discuss your report. Thanks for having me, Drew. So Ben, what would you say inspired this research? It was really with a bunch of conversations with my children's teachers, they're in public schools, with other public school teacher friends of mine, and they would complain about the increase in bureaucracy and the added staff outside the classroom, and they didn't like it. And that's what led me to do this work on the staffing search. Mm. And what exactly did you measure, and were there any limitations? Yes. So, so like you said, I used data that state departments of education annual, annually report to the U.S. Department of Education. And I looked at the increase in students. And since 1950 to, to 2015, the number of students in American public schools basically doubled. The increase in staff was about four times as great as the increase in students. So who were those increase in staff? I was able to use that data that was it's publicly available to separate public school employees into teachers and everybody else. So teachers in one bucket and the other bucket, school administrators, district administrators, janitors, bus drivers, counselors, social workers, curriculum specialists, reading coaches, math coaches, etc. So what I found was that while public school employees increased four times as fast as the increase in students, teachers increased two and a half times as fast as the increase in students, which led to significant class size reductions. People knew that class sizes have been smaller. But what I think people didn't realize is the increase in administrators and all other staff was about seven times as large as the increase in students, uh, which is rather dramatic. Yeah. And so then with all of that in mind, how do you respond to potential critics who say the surge in staffing was necessary in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and maybe even 90s because of desegregation, IDEA, et cetera. Yes. Um, if you listen to firsthand accounts of African Americans who were in public schools in this country in the 50s and 60s, you know, they were separated from white students into, into separate schools. And in the African American schools, they typically only had a teacher funded by the school district. Nothing else. No other funding. Um, so when you integrated schools, of course you need to hire extra staff in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Um, as late as 1970, about 80% of special needs students weren't even allowed in public schools. So, of course, when you allowed special needs students to come into public schools, of course you needed extra staff in the 70s and 80s. Right. But what I show in the report is that even in the modern times, which I call post-1992, there was a modern staffing surge after all of that. Wow. And so have public schools seen a return on this massive investment in teachers, and especially administrators and other non-teaching staff. Are students doing any better? The, the short answer is no. <laughs> um, we spent billions of dollars on this staffing surge, but there's no measurable evidence that student outcomes are higher. Um, in fact, on high school tests, uh, on the National Assessment for Education Progress, the NAEP tests, um, test scores have basically been flat during the modern staffing surge. Another piece of data is high school graduation rates. From 1970 till about the year 2000, during a massive staffing surge, high school graduation rates actually declined. Um, so there's really no evidence that higher public school staffing has led to higher student outcomes. None. If only there were some seminal piece of research that showed that the more money that you put into the system doesn't really influence the outcomes. Yes, there's, I know you're being funny. There's actually a lot of research on that. So, yeah, that's a common finding. So, Ben, tell us about this teacher salary stagnation. 
Yeah, so in the modern staffing surge, I was able to look at 1992 to 2014 was the most recent data I could get for this. Public school students saw a 27% increase in real resources spent on their education. So adjusted for inflation, public schools per student were spending 27% more in 2014 relative to 1992. So you would think that educators on the front lines would have gotten a salary increase out of that. They actually didn't. Um, From 1992 to 2014, public school teacher salaries actually declined by 2% adjusted for inflation. So adjusted for cost of living, teachers in 2014 had lower salaries than teachers in 1992. Wow, that's incredible. And not in a good way. No, that's terrible. So when budgets do decrease, you know, as they did during that whole Great Recession, how did staffing change in public schools? Yes, the Great Recession was a historical anomaly. Um, Big increases in unemployment, um, big decreases in property values, which meant less money for public schools. And it was very well publicized that they reduced staff in the 2009 to 2012 period during the Great Recession. Um, But you got to put those staffing declines in context. The previous 60 years saw this massive staffing surge, and actually the staffing decline in public schools during the Great Recession was actually pretty modest. Um, But second thing, it might even be more interesting. So when when revenues were growing in public schools, they they had a preference for non-teaching staff. But when revenues were falling, they actually laid off teachers more than they laid off administrators and all other staff. So even when revenues were declining, the public school system still showed a preference for non-teaching staff. Wow. It's almost like they view the teachers as more expendable than the non-teaching staff. That's exactly how they they made their staffing decisions, yes. So then who exactly is responsible for making those hiring, firing, and even salary decisions? Yeah, That's actually a loaded question. I mean, because at a simple level, you would think it's the local school district. And they're the ones who literally hire and fire teachers and make salary decisions. But there's a big but there. Um, You actually have three levels of government that influence this. You have the U.S. Congress that gives money to local public schools. The U.S. Congress passes laws that govern public schools. The U.S. Department of Education writes rules to implement those laws. The U.S. Department of Education gives guidance that really isn't tied to any law to kind of bully school districts to do what they want. But then you have the same thing at the state level. State legislators give money to districts. You know, state legislators pass laws that regulate local public schools. State department of bureaucracies, you know, write guidance and, and, and policy to govern local public schools. Then you have the same thing at the district level. You have a little bureaucracy there in the central office. You have school boards, et cetera. So you really have a, a bunch of different hands in the pot. And when I speak publicly about the staffing surge, depending on where the educators are located, they always blame the other two levels of government. Mm. So local officials will blame, oh, it's the state's fault. It's the Fed's fault. State officials say, well, it's the locals, you know, bloating the, the payroll and it's federal regulations. And, and federal officials say, oh, no, it's, it's happening at the state and local level. The truth be told, they're all to blame. Yeah, so it's my people are doing the right job. It's everyone else that's messing up. Exactly. That's essentially the argument at all three levels of government. Yeah. So then what would you say is the cost associated with the staffing surge? Were, would you, were you able to calculate that in any meaningful way? Yes. I was able to use data that State Departments of Education reported to the feds on compensation for non-teaching staff in public schools. And I wanted to be cautious, so I wanted an underestimate. So my underestimate of the annual cost of non-teaching staff is $60,000 per employee. That includes salary, health benefits, retirement benefits, FICA taxes, unemployment insurance, recruiting costs, training costs. Which that'd be pretty low for a principal. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, It's higher for some other staff, but in the aggregate, that's actually a low number. Um, And what I found is that if from 1992 to 2015, which is the most recent data I could get, the number of students in American public schools increased 20%. The number of all staff increased 37%, so almost twice as much. But let's let them keep the increase in teachers, which was 29%. So, so over that time, class sizes did decrease. Mm-hmm. But the increase in all other staff was 47%, so over twice the increase in students. But suppose the increase in all other staff, instead of being 47%, was only 20% to match the increase in students. 
what I found was that the savings to the public school system would have been about $35 billion a year. That's annual recurring savings they would get year after year. That is fascinating. So what could you do with – what could they do with all that money? I mean one thing you could do with $35 billion a year is give every teacher a permanent $11,100 a year raise forever. Um, you know, and I think teachers deserve that. But instead, we use that money to hire extra non-teaching staff. Second thing you could do with that money is you could have allowed states – to give education savings accounts or ESAs so that parents and students could choose private schools if they wanted to. They could use that money for other educational services or save some of it for college. You could give over 4 million students $8,000 a year education savings accounts. Um, And so you could give parents more school choice opportunities. Wow. I know a lot of teachers and families that would love either of those options. Yeah. So instead of giving teachers raises, instead of giving parents and students more school choice opportunities, We hired more non-teaching staff in public schools for decades. And why do you think this has been able to go on for so long? I think part of it is people didn't know it was happening. So that's one reason to write the report is to sort of let people know, let parents know, teachers, policymakers know about this problem. Second is what I said earlier about the three levels of government. I think by having three levels and each level has their own preferences about, you know, we need more graduation coaches or we need more of this, we need more of that. So you just layer it on, layer it on, and there's your staffing surge. Oh. And so speaking of policymakers, uh, how can they use these findings? What can they take away and use right now? Yeah, data is power. So when they get jumped at a town hall meeting by, by you know, teachers union people or school leaders, um, they could pull a little index card out of their pocket and say, hey, did you know the staffing in your district has increased by X you know, compared to students? You know, so you've been having the staffing surge. Same thing at the state level. So I think state legislators can be cognizant of this and can maybe redirect, you know, the increases in public school resources to teachers, but also to school choice opportunities for families. Oh, that's fascinating. And is there any other research that might come out following this report? Yeah, as you well know, when you write a report for Ed Choice, it gets reviewed extensively, but by professors, by national think tank people but also by the the, uh, research staff here at EdChoice. Nerds like me. Yeah, yeah, you were one of the reviewers, as you know. Um, One of your colleagues, Marty Lucan, who's a national expert on the public sector pension crisis, made a comment, and he said that the staffing search is a double whammy to our our public pension crisis. And what he said was that instead of using that money to fully fund pensions promised to public sector employees, to teachers and school employees, instead we're using it to hire extra staff. And then the double whammy is you're hiring extra staff into an unfunded pension system. So so it's kind of burning the candle at both ends. So I had the idea from his comment, and another referee actually made that comment as well. And so I've been talking to Marty about let's write a paper together about how the staffing surge has exacerbated the, the public sector pension crisis in each state. Yeah. I would be very interested in reading a ref draft for that. (laughs) <laughs> I'm sure you will. Yeah. Uh, so other than that piece of research, what's next for you? Um, I'm also writing a paper with your colleague, Robert Enlow, who is the head of the EdChoice. And uh, we're writing what's called the new role of government in education. In 1955, Milton Friedman kicked off the modern school choice movement by writing a, a short chapter in an edited volume called The Role of Government Education. What Robert Enlow and I want to do is update that 1955 piece for the modern day. What have we learned since 1955 about educational choice? What's been the evolution of the public school system? What are some modern challenges facing American families? And let's update Milton Friedman's idea for the modern day. Mm. Stay tuned, dear listeners. And Ben, do you have anything else to add? That's all I have for today. All right. Well, there you have it. To learn more about this research or to download the full report, visit www.edchoice.org slash staffing surge. For all of us at EdChoice, I'm Drew Catt. Thanks for listening.